Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Donna Lainwan Leje. I'm the managing editor of USA Today, and I am a past president of the National Press Club. We are really delighted to have all of you here with us today. And we're very pleased also to present a panel on a newly released report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine on an issue that has such wide-ranging impact, the increased cost of prescription medicines. The report concludes that the biopharmaceutical sector is not giving consumers adequate access to effective and affordable medicines. It offers eight recommendations for meeting this public health imperative. Within these eight recommendations are 27 actions that the industry, government, and other players could take to improve drug affordability without, the report says, squelching research and development of new drugs. The report takes a hard look at competition in the industry, the patent process, the supply chain, and the business of supplying and buying medicine. We have a very distinguished panel here to help guide us through the key elements of this report. But first, I'm going to discuss with you some logistics of how we're going to do this. The report, Making Medicines Affordable, a National Imperative, is now released and the embargo is lifted. The report and supporting materials can be found at the following URL, nationalacademies.org forward slash affordable drugs. If you wish to tweet or follow the discussion on Twitter, please use the hashtag uh, pound sign N-A-S-E-M affordable drugs. I'll be guiding us through what I expect is going to be a robust hour of discussion about the report. We'll begin with brief intro introductions of our panelists and an introduction of the report, followed by some questions for each of the panelists. Then I'll open up the discussion to the room for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Wait until you have the, the microphone before you ask your question. Um, also, please tell us your name and affiliation. In the interest of time, please make your questions brief and make them questions. In other words, please refrain from speech making. If you are not in the room, you can submit questions via email. Please include your name, affiliation, and your question. Again, same rules apply. The email is affordabledrugs at nas.edu. So I'm going to begin by uh, introducing our panelists, starting with Chairman Norman Augustine. Mr. Augustine is a retired chairman and chief executive officer of Lockheed Martin Corporation. He has served as an assistant secretary, undersecretary, and subsequently acting secretary of the US Army. He has served for 16 years on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology under both Republican and Democratic presidents. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and former chairman of the National Academy of Engineering. Next, Senator Jeff Bingaman. Senator Bingaman represented New Mexico in the Senate for three decades, from 1983 to 2013. His committee assignments in the Senate included, included the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, the Committee on Finance, the Joint Economic Committee, Committee on Armed Services, and the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Professor Michelle Mello is a professor of law at Stanford Law, Stanford law School and a professor of health research and policy at Stanford University School of Medicine. She previously served as a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health where she directed the program in law and public health. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Eliseo Perez Stable is the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. Previously, Dr. Perez Stable was a professor of medicine and the director of the Center for Aging in Diverse Communities at the University of California, San Francisco. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. And finally, Professor Charles Phelps is a university professor and provost emeritus at the University of Rochester. Previously, he, he has served as a senior staff economist and the director of the Program on Regulatory Policies and Institutions at the Rand Corporation. His research cuts across fields of health, economics, health policy, health technology assessment, and related topics. He is also a member of the National Academy of Medicine. So we're going to get us started with uh, Mr. Augustine. I can advise 
hope not to fall off the podium, so we're <laughs> going to be very careful. Well, good afternoon. Uh, making medicines affordable has emerged as a national priority, as we've particularly seen in recent weeks. The cost of biopharmaceuticals now represents about 17% of the total cost of health care in America. And the rate of growth in the cost of biopharmaceuticals significantly exceeds the rate of growth of both the uh, 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 the rate of growth of the inflation rate in the economy as well as of family income. And a recent, uh, very recent survey of adult Americans uh, that was that asked. Uh, what should be the highest priority ranking on various topics for the U.S. Congress in the rest of this year, uh, revealed that among those responding to the survey, uh, that the cost of pharmaceuticals would be the highest. That was above such topics as uh, raising uh, the minimum wage, uh, reducing the deficit, uh, rebuilding the nation's infrastructure, or reducing uh, taxes. And the amount of money that Americans spend on health care as a whole is equal to about 18% of the gross domestic product. And this is a fraction that's increased steadily for the past 60 years. This has led to what today is the highest per capita expenditure on health care uh, in the entire world. Further, the trend of increased spending, including on biopharmaceuticals, is projected to continue in the years ahead as the baby boomer generation ages. The nation with health care spending that most closely approximates that of the United States as a fraction of their GDP allocates about seven percentage points less of their GDP uh, to that purpose. And to put that in perspective, uh, seven percent of the U.S. GDP uh, would fund America's uh, primary and secondary education system. It would fund two defense budgets, and it would fund three of the public transportation and highway budgets in this country. And while it's clearly in the public interest to devote significant funding to health care, uh, such funding is not without its opportunity costs. Annual average expenditures on biopharmaceuticals in the United States now exceed half a trillion dollars. At the last, uh, uh, excuse me, the cost of drugs has escalated uh, in recent years uh, insurance plans have implemented benefit designs that attempt to uh, preserve access to care and yet to keep health premiums at a sustainable and affordable level. Uh, they've did, done this by adjusting formularies, uh, by uh, increasing co-payments and deductibles and other such uh, actions, uh, almost all of which have resulted in increased cost to the patient. Uh, deductibles themselves have increased by about a factor of two and a half in the last decade. Yet while few argue that the current system is acceptable, uh, virtually every newly proposed potential corrective measure that has been brought forth has confronted strong opposition from one group or another. This is in part because an overarching moral issue remains unresolved in the United States. That is, is access to health care, including prescription drugs, a fundamental human right? And if it's not, who is to decide and on what basis which individuals are to be denied access to the drugs that they need? But if health care is a right, who is to pay its costs? And is that cost affordable not only to the individual but to society as a whole? And does it represent the most appropriate allocation of the nation's limited resources? The burden of high-priced drugs often falls disproportionately on vulnerable elements of the population in spite of government, industry, charitable events and efforts to alleviate its impact. For example, the Kaiser Family Foundation reports that in 2015, about 20% of prescriptions were not filled due to affordability considerations on part of the family or the patient. Other drugs uh, that were acquired were rationed by the individuals who were intended to use them. About two-thirds of the personal bankruptcies in America have been attributed entirely or in part to the overall cost of medical care, including prescription drugs. 
Public concern regarding the cost of pharmaceuticals have accentuated in recent years by a number of sudden and relatively unexplained events that have led to large increases in the price of various existing drugs. Uh, for example, uh, media reports have cited the unanticipated increase in the price of uh, two packs of EpiPens used to administer epidephrine, a treatment for potentially fatal allergic reactions, increased from $160 to more than $600. And perhaps the most egregious such uh, cases involved the rights to the existing non-patent protected drug, Darprim, which is used in treatment of severe infections, with a relatively small market that makes it unattractive to potential competitors. The rights to the drug were purchased from its developer by Turing Pharmaceuticals, which raised the drug's price from $13.50 to $750 per tablet. In this environment, uh, the leadership of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine initiated an evidence-based consensus study of the reasons behind the rising costs of drugs, as well as potential actions that could be taken to assure that drugs were both affordable and available. And under a charter that was uh, initially approved in 1863 by President Lincoln, uh, the academies offer advice to the nation on issues that do relate to science, engineering, and medicine. And the committee of 17 members was formed, uh, composed of individuals with a diverse set of uh, professional backgrounds. Uh, backgrounds such as uh, federal and state government, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, the practice of medicine, uh, health policy, consumer engagement, research and development, economics, law, public health, and business management. Uh, during its year-long deliberations, uh, the committee received presentations from 39 individuals or organizations. Uh, we received inputs from the members of the public. We received several, we reviewed uh, in depth several thousand pages of documents pertaining to the topic at hand, and uh, we benefited from written inputs from a a uh, number of documents submitted by individuals and organizations. Uh, the committee's draft report uh, was subje subjected to an in-depth review by 16 highly qualified anonymous reviewers and uh, also by two overseers uh, of that process. And the committee provided specific responses to each of the issues that was raised uh, in the re reviewers' comments. In its report, uh, Making Medicines Affordable, a national imperative, the committee presented 32 findings, eight recommendations, and 27 implementing actions. And although the committee was very specifically and very intensely uh, composed of individuals having highly diverse uh, backgrounds professionally, each of the recommendations presented in the report enjoys the support of a substantial majority of the members of the committee. Some of the uh, findings and, and recommendations include uh, unanimous support. Uh, two of our colleagues, while agreeing with some of the recommendations, have expressed concern that taken collectively, the recommendations are excessively severe and can provide uh, damaging, or can pr pr prove damaging to the nation's healthcare system. A minority perspective uh, was offered by seven other colleagues that endorses the report's recommendations, but argues that the needs, the U.S. needs a still more ambitious approach to transparency, value assessment, and uh, uh, pricing, both today and in the future. The views of these two perspectives are presented in the appendix to the report, but I would emphasize that this is a report that enjoys a strong consensus of its membership. An effective biopharmaceutical enterprise uh, has a long history in this country of producing life-enhancing and life-saving accomplishments. It is critically important to the nation's well-being. Without uh, past contributions, uh, this sector, uh, supported by research uh, funded by various agencies of the federal government, uh, by universities, private philanthropy, venture capitalists, and biopharmaceutical firms themselves, uh, there would have been no vaccines for many deadly diseases, no statins, uh, uh, no cure for conditions such as hepatitis C. 
This is an enterprise that literally saved lives. Yet, rising prices threaten to make its products unaffordable to patients or even to society as a whole. In the case of most business sectors in the United States, the pressure of competition is the dominant force in controlling prices. And to the extent that competition is present, uh, this is true of the biopharmaceutical sector as well. Nonetheless, if firms have invested heavily to introduce new products, were to be immediately confronted with competitors that had not made such investments, there would be very little motivation, motivation or justification for conducting research and innovating. And in recognize the importance of encouraging innovation, the U.S. Congress provided uh, uh, the authority to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. And so that is, in exchange for undertaking research and development to introduce new products, the government can and does grant patents to firms and individuals, thereby conferring on them what are in effect sole source positions in the market for a specified period of time. And when the period of patent exclusivity for a drug expires, companies other than the originator have the uh, freedom to introduce copies of the known uh, generics or biosimilars. The latter uh, biosimilars represent about 89% of all prescriptions, excuse me, these latter products represent uh, about 89% of all prescriptions written, yet uh, about 24% of the cost of prescription drugs. That's a reference to generics. And when generics do enter the market, the experience uh, shows that the price of the original patented product frequently drops substantially as the developer seeks either to compete with the new lower cost of entrance in the marketplace or else forfeit some or all of the market. There's but one example, uh, the price of Lipitor, the widely used anti-cholesterol drug, dropped from $3.29 per unit to $0.11 cents per unit when the patent protection expired. Market forces that promote innovating while also providing price controlling pressures have worked quite effectively in the United States in most industrial settings. Raising the question uh, why they appear to be far less effective in the biopharmaceutical area. The answer resides in the fact that the biopharmaceutical enterprise has many important features that distinguish it from virtually any other market in the United States. Perhaps the most important among these features is that products of biopharmaceutical industry can be indispensable, even to life itself, thereby leaving a patient with very little or no negotiating strength. Further, the biopharmaceutical sector of the United States has a market structure that is substantially more complex than that of any other sector of healthcare, and perhaps more complex than that of any other sector of the total U.S. economy. It's fraught with discordant viewpoints, divergent priorities, and potential conflicts of interest that impede the provision of affordable pharmaceuticals, especially to the sociologically and socioeconomically disadvantaged. The party often possessing the least power in this complex, uh, relatively opaque structure, ironically is its raison d'etre, namely the patient. The committee concludes that the current approach to the provision of biopharmaceuticals in the United States is not sustainable. And if that is the case, two other broad options remain. The first is to repair the current system, and the second is to replace the current system with a new system. Having dismissed the option of doing nothing, uh, the report uh, written by the committee offers recommendations based on the preponderance of the available evidence and seeks to improve upon the existing system. Should such steps or others like them prove insufficient, uh, the remaining choice would seem to be a system that involves substantially increased government sponsorship and control, single payer insurance, uh, i.e. the government, accompanied by a governmentally imposed explicit or de facto uh, price regulation. Stated in highly abbreviated form, some of the actions proposed by the committee uh, are as follows. The federal government should consolidate and apply its purchasing power to directly negotiate prices with the producers and suppliers of medicines, 
and strengthen formulary design. The government should also improve methods for assessing the value that drugs provide and ensure that incentives to develop drugs for rare diseases are not extended to widely sold drugs. In addition, increased disclosure of the financial flows and profitability among the participants in the biopharmaceutical sector as a whole should be required. Action should be taken to continually foster access to off-patent generic drugs, which are usually much less expensive than branded products. One way that this could be accomplished would be to prevent practices that delay the entry of gen generics into the market, and thereby uh, extend the exclusivity of branded products. Another critical step is to accelerate the view review process that is required of manufacturers before they can introduce generic drugs. Action should be taken to eliminate existing incentives that encourage patients and clinicians to seek or prescribe more expensive drugs rather than less expensive drugs uh, that have uh, comparable efficacy. One such action would be to discourage, to discourage direct to consumer advertising uh, for prescription drugs and to provide substantially more balanced information to patients about the pot potential benefits and costs of alternative treatments, thereby reducing unsubstantiated demand for higher priced drugs. Insurance plans should be modified to reduce the financial burden that patients and their families currently experience when they need costly prescription drugs. And individual cost sharing arrangements that are based on drug prices should be calculated as a fraction of the net purchase price of drugs rather than as the part of the list price. The government should also tighten qualification for discount programs that have drifted from their original stated intent which was to help vulnerable populations. And finally, cost sharing by patient controlled, patients enrolled in Medicare Part D should be terminated when the annual catastrophic uh, threshold has been reached, uh, and that done on a yearly basis. These and other recommendations and implementing actions are discussed in the committee's report in considerable detail. In carrying out the assignment we were given, we sought to balance the need for affordable drugs with the need for an industry healthy enough and capable enough to develop new drugs for future patients. And in the end, drugs that are not affordable are of little value, and drugs that don't exist are of no value. Thank you very much, and I will turn to you. All right, so I'm going to start off with a couple of questions and then turn to the audience here, but I'm going to uh, address the first question to Senator Bingman. Um, what's your read on Congress? A lot of these recommendations um, re would depend on a willingness from Congress to address some of these issues. Uh, what are some of, where do you think Congress would go on some of these recommendations, such as the restrictions on direct-to-consumer advertising? Well, I'm not sure uh, what Congress would wind up doing. I do think it's encouraging. Uh, I think there's a hearing scheduled already in the health and, uh, health and Education, the HELP Committee there in the Senate on the 12th of December. Uh, 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 Norm is going to testify at that, and uh, Senator Alexander has indicated an interest in this subject, and I'm sure Patty Murray also has a great interest. So they've had good, good success in working in a bipartisan way on other difficult issues. I think there's a chance that you could get some traction uh, on this set of issues in the Senate as well. Now, in the House, I can't tell you. Uh, I, I, I'm, you, you have to find somebody else who's a little more expert on that subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And let me uh, offer this up to Professor Mello. Um, so you, uh, I guess one of your areas of expertise is uh, with generic drugs, is that correct? Well, let me, let me ask you about the direct-to-consumer advertising. So uh, Congress has banned direct-to-consumer con advertising in other areas before, such as um, uh, tobacco products. Um, and you can't turn on the TV these days, with especially the Golf Channel, without seeing an, you know, an ad for you know, erectile dis dysfunction or something like that. So uh, what do you think Congress should do? Where, um, 
how are these direct-to-consumer adver ad, uh, advertising affecting how we purchase drugs? Well, anyone who watches television knows that these ads are pervasive, and anyone who studies the area knows that they are contributing to the cost of prescription drugs by encouraging patients to request and physicians to prescribe more costly branded medications where uh, cheaper alternatives are available. In terms of what should be done to curb DTCA, that's a tricky question from a legal perspective. The Supreme Court has signaled increasing uh, protectiveness towards commercial speech. And that makes it a treacherous time to try to impose direct restrictions on DTCA. And for that reason, notwithstanding the history with cigarettes, which is more complicated and includes really some tacit agreement by the industry to go along with the ban, um, our preference was to encourage, uh, first of all, industry codes of conduct that would voluntarily begin to rein in DTCA combined with the elimination of the tax credit for DTCA as a business expense uh, through which we all essentially subsidize a socially undesirable activity. Okay. All right. I'm going to throw the next question to Professor Phelps. The, um, the report recommends that the U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission should intervene to prevent manufacturers from paying uh, other producers for delayed entry into the market. Um, so you know, the sort of the pay for delay I agreements. Um, what does this report propose as an alternative? And should such agreements actually be illegal? Well, the, the legality, I think, is uh, uh, certainly a question uh, with the current law. Uh, so partly what we're looking at is, is the current law sufficient? And partly we're looking at the question, is there uh, essentially sufficient attention to paid to enforcing? Uh, in many cases, this may be a question of prosecutorial discretion uh, rather than uh, what the law actually enables. Uh, the same type of discretion arises in uh, uh, the issuing of patents as whether they do constitute truly novel inventions that deserve new patenting, which is a, another form of extending a patent life. Uh, in terms of the pay for delay uh, question you directly asked me, uh, I've done a fair amount of work in antitrust uh, in healthcare in my past. Uh, m my view would be in any, almost any other sector of the he health economy or any economy uh, that you might look at, uh, directly paying somebody else to stay out of the market would be flatly illegal. Uh, so I'm in some puzzled as to how the practice continues at all. I do know it's under increasing review. Uh, our, our report urges that it be eliminated uh, unambiguously, mm -hmm. that the practice be unambiguously eliminated. Okay. And one for Professor Perez Stavler. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the, uh, the orphan drugs. So uh, we've read about a new cancer drug, uh, for example, that makes use of some of these biomarkers and uh, using genetic makeup, and the prices are extraordinary. Uh, I heard one doctor refer to it as the price, the, think of the price of the drugs as parts and then add another half a million for labor. Um, how do we continue to um, how do we continue to introduce these interesting innovations in, in science um, and get public companies, pharmaceutical companies interested in still um, providing these drugs and get, get rid of these exorbitant prices? Well, on the side of orphan drugs, I think, one has to look at this in parallel to what we have done with vaccines in this country, which is to take them as there is a common good to having an orphan drug because there is no clear large market to this group, and, and yet the public will need it uh, when people develop a certain disease. And, and there should be some general consensus and agreement on some limit of what the cost of these drugs would be or something that would be more rational. And that is one of the recommendations that is listed in the report. I, I would also, uh, I you know, not want to have anything done to inhibit or slow down the innovation of discovery, because we are at a very exciting time in science. I would argue that most of that innovation actually is coming from the National Institutes of Health and related scientists that are, that are funded in a discovery phase, and that the pharmaceutical companies that are actually setting the prices for these uh, drugs, when they are really quite remarkable, um, uh, are an only part of, of, the, of, of, the, of the pathway of these medications. 
So actually that raises another issue. So, you know, as you mentioned, so many of the for-profit pharmaceutical companies benefit from the basic research that's already being done by institutes such as NIH and federal grants given to universities. Uh, I'll throw this out to anybody. How does the federal government get a better return on that investment from companies that then build on them for research? And how can that be passed on to the consumer? Well, I'll start out with that and just uh, introductory uh, comments and someone else may want to pick up on that. The, uh, uh, it's a circumstance that exists uh, in all industries today that uh, corporations uh, have so many uh, discouragements from investing in research, basic research of the kind that's funded by the uh, NIH or the NSF or others. Uh, and that's brought about by the demand of the marketplace for returns in the next quarter, not 10 years from now, which most research does. And as a result, uh, companies uh, tend to invest in development rather than research. And so I think the argument there is that there's a, a, a companionship that's necessary. Uh, industry, uh, take the Bell Labs, the Xerox Park, and many of the famous research industrial facilities of the past. By and large, they don't exist today. And so if research is going to be done in today's marketplace, it will have to be funded by the government, probably performed by universities, and then rely on industry to use its expertise to uh, uh, produce, manufacture, and, and uh, deliver uh, the products. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, has been taking place over years. Uh, uh, two decades ago, two-thirds of the R&D in this country was uh, funded by the government. Today, it's one-third. But today, industry funds almost two-thirds. Uh, it's just that industry doesn't fund research. Uh, it does development. And so it's this combination that I think is very powerful. Uh, those two need each other. Somebody may want to improve on that. Uh. Well, I would just add, I, I think the NIH has gotten a tremendous return on its investment in terms of the amount of innovation coming out of the industry. And I would say, I might not have said that 15 years ago, but recently there really has been a surge in the amount of truly innovative products. And now with the advent of precision medicine, just the promise to combine that with diagnostics, also supported by basic science research, um, is incredible. To answer the question of how we may ensure that we recapture the value, what's left, the work that is left to be done is making sure that ordinary consumers can access that innovation. And that's what our report is aimed at. Okay. All right. Well, I'll open. Did anyone else want to add anything? Or okay, let me open this up to the floor. Does anyone have a question? And just remember your uh, your name and your affiliation. Jeff, you might want to start with that. Well, uh, <laughs> if you take the speeches that are made on this subject, uh, they'll, they'll go ahead and, and uh, enact and, and implement all of these recommendations. Uh, I think both parties uh, have uh, solidly endorsed the idea that, uh, uh, that uh, prescription drugs are too high, that something has to be done, that something major has to be done. And uh, if, if, if there's substance to that uh, claim, then, uh, then here are eight recommendations that they need to look at seriously. I, I really don't see most of these. Uh, uh, the one which I voted on many times during the time I was in the Senate, of course, was this issue of uh, whether or not the government should be able to negotiate, Medicare in particular should be able to negotiate prices with drug companies. Uh, to me, that's something both parties should be behind, and uh, we make a strong case for it here in the, in the report. I think it would have a big imp impact on the uh, price of drugs over the coming years, and uh, uh, we're the only major industrial country I'm aware of that doesn't uh, engage in that today. So I think uh, that, that's, that's one that I think they ought to start with. Oh, yeah, sure. 
Um, the question particularly, uh, you, you said most of these things we've rec uh, recommended in the court have been raised before. The answer is yes. There's almost nothing one could think of that hadn't been discussed previously in this world. Um, the, the one that, uh, that Jeff just discussed, uh, 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 central go centralized government price negotiation, I think has become increasingly urgent uh, because the, uh, m the, the essentially the balance of power in market negotiation has shifted through time. As more and more people gain health insurance coverage of prescription drugs, their in personal interest in worrying about prices has gone down and that opens up the ability for manufacturers to raise, uh, and others in the supply chain to raise prices uh, uh, more and more. So in, in effect, in a completely uninsured market with no price controls, uh, price could go anywhere <laughs> uh, if everyone had insurance. So the, the growth of insurance to me over time makes the question that uh, Senator Bingman had discussed increasingly urgent for action. I think certainly, and, and uh, we were very interested to hear about some nonprofit models that have been very successful. One of our own committee uh, members is the CEO of such a company and, and has been very successful. Clearly, it's not going to work for all drugs, but for particular kinds of drugs where we have the, the uh, molecule has already been developed and it's a question of how you deliver it at a cheaper price particularly for measures that are important globally but are not particularly profitable here in the U.S. I think those models are very interesting to explore. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh in? No? Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Steve Knievel. I'm an access to medicines advocate at the consumer advocacy organization Public Citizen. Uh, I'm going to throw a question at you that's maybe uh, a little bit sensitive and maybe it's best for you, Senator. Um, right now, <laughs> yesterday, the health committee had its hearing on the nomination of Alex Azar, um, who was until recently the president of Lilly USA. When he was at Lilly USA, the company raised the price of insulin radically uh, in lockstep with other insulin producing companies, uh, Sanofi, Novo Nordisk. Uh, do you think it's appropriate for pharmaceutical company executive that has a history of engaging in severe price gouging that has inhibited access to medicine for diabetes patients to be the, the head of our healthcare system at a time as when you're, as a report says, we have this severe problem with access to affordable medicines. Well, I, I'll respond briefly. Thank you for the question. Uh, our focus was very much on uh, biopharmaceuticals specifically uh, as a group. Uh, frankly, we have no competence or charter in to really answer the question you've asked. Uh, I think that's for others. Uh, the one thing we do know is that uh, HHS is going to have some very difficult decisions to make in the time ahead. And uh, whoever does lead it uh, certainly has our best wishes to be successful. But. Uh, the, your specific question is uh, out of our realm of competence. Senator Bingaman, did you want to weigh in on any part of that? I, I would just uh, say that one of the advantages of retiring from the Senate is you don't get to vote. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I will not be voting on uh, Dr. Azar, Mr. Azar's uh, uh, nomination, so I don't really have a position. Let me, let me uh, jump in here and, and talk about a little bit the, ref the revolving door between pharmaceutical companies and government agencies such as the, you know, the FDA and things like that. Does that uh, present a problem in the pricing of drugs and how uh, research is conducted and what, um, what drugs get approved? Um, we all know that there is sort of a regulatory revolving door. I'll throw that out to the professors. Well, our, 
report doesn't speak to that, but it does speak to the general issue that you're raising, which is conflicts of interest. Uh, we found that conflicts of interest are just rife in the sector. There are many examples. Um, one simple one pertains to physicians who dispense uh, or administer drugs in their offices or in infusion facilities and are compensated yeah. under Medicare Part B. They're compensated based on the list price of the drug plus 6%, so their financial incentive is not to provide the best drug but to provide the most expensive drug. Uh, there are other ways that we could pay them with a fixed fee, but we don't. Um, there are many other examples as well of where we should get at what we all agree are undesirable conflicts of interest in the system. Does anyone else want to weigh in? I, I would add that uh, one of the other components is the industry's reach to trainees and to academic health centers. Historically, when I started my training, it was not uncommon to have pharmaceutical lunches and detailee visits, and gradually a majority of academic uh, health centers, particularly those with training uh, programs, have really d divorced themselves from that whole relationship. And I think our report calls for making sure that that is universally accepted. That influences how clinicians practice, the kinds of drugs that they prescribe, and, and even the indications that they use the medications for. And that's been shown time and time again over many years in multiple research articles. So I think that's another area where we can create more of a separation mm -hmm. uh, with the conflicts of interest that exist. Mm -hmm. And Professor Feld, did you want to say something? I guess the only thing I'd add is that uh, in s sometimes the experience that people gain in one sector uh, can add value in their next job, and it goes in both directions. People going from government can uh, do well in, in, uh, in industry and, and vice versa, and, and whether they carry a bias forward in one direction or another is a personal decision of theirs. The, the, the real question is the one Michelle has raised, uh, and that is are there ongoing financial incentive conflicts? Somebody could learn a lot in industry and then uh, become a, a, a good leader in, in government or, vi or vice versa uh, without having a conflict if their morals and their incentives that they confront are, are not uh, goofed up. So I wouldn't preclude these kinds of, of what you'd call the revolving door arrangements, but I'd want to make sure uh, absolutely that there was no ongoing in, uh, financial incentive involved for a, a long time during the transition. <laughs> Okay, great. So oh, lots of questions, but I want to make sure we also get uh, our questions from, from the email. So let me take a couple of those, and then we'll get to you. Yes, um, thank you. We have a question from Robert Cook Deegan. Um, his question is... And his is affiliation? Um, uh, ASU, okay. um, Arizona State University. His question is, is the idea here to have Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, the VA, the military health system, FEHBP, and other programs to have one federal unit device formularies <coughs> and negotiate, devi to devise formularies and negotiate prices for all programs or for each program to do so independently or CMS to do um, Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, and others to proceed separately. That sounds like Michelle and Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll start on that. It, it's a mix, actually. We've proposed that the federal government negotiate uh, collectively on its behalf, and states would be able to opt in in their programs as they desired. Uh, there's no uh, necessary implication that they have a common formulary, and I think that would probably unexpected given the diversity in state Medicaid programs if they entered to have a common formulary. So m my answer would be that we're proposing uh, a, a, a unified federal negotiation, states opting as they wish, but no, necessary, no ne necessarily 100% uh, conformance on formulary choice. Nothing to add? No. Okay. All right. We'll go back to the audience. Can I say a few questions? Well, let's wait to <laughs> Sarah Jane Tribble with Kaiser Health News. I actually have two questions, one following up on that one and another one on orphan drugs. My first question following up on that one is on negotiations. If indeed what you are uh, proposing, as, as the report reads, is to have Medicare, Medicaid, and, and government agencies negotiate, that would mean that you're also asking them to decide on kind of 
formally rationing of drugs. If you negotiate drugs, you have to have a, an alternative. You have to say, no, we won't buy that drug, right, to get the price down. So I'd like, you, like a few of you to comment on that, if you will, or at least one of you to comment on the idea that you're encouraging the idea that here in the U.S. we're going to decide to ration drugs in some way or choose which drugs are on the formularies in some way with price negotiation, or are you? So that's my first question. So I guess you could comment on that one. Well, I, I think the idea of negotiations, and defer to my economist uh, colleague here if uh, incorrect, is really not to not so much with the idea of rationing to begin with, but to get a price that is negotiated by the government or by CMS, even CMS by itself, much like our European colleagues do. Uh, these medications go outside. The European systems will say, well, this is what we'll pay for it. We think this is the fair price. And, and the industry will accept it because they want the market. And the same would be true in this country. Right now, it doesn't happen that way. They set the price, and CMS will pay uh, the whatever proportion it is they're going to reimburse. And the gap is coming out of pocket. And I think we haven't mentioned that yet, but the decrease, the out-of-pocket burden on our patients with chronic disease, uh, which is the increasing proportion of the population, I think is a real important priority in the healthcare system that we, that we need to address because more and more patients are paying thousands of dollars out of pocket every year when they either reach the donut hole or they're a very expensive drug, they're above the catastrophic limit and they're paying 5% of a large sum so it adds up to quite a bit of money. Uh, as far as rationing, we, we shouldn't uh, fool ourselves. We have rationing now. Um, there are many, there are 10% of the population doesn't have any healthcare coverage. If they go to buy the insulin that a few years ago was $10 for a month supply and now costs $300, uh, they're being rationed because they're deciding on do, do I control my diabetes or do I pay my rent? And so this is the everyday reality of a significant number of people out there. Um, not necessarily the $20,000 biologic drug, which does wonders for some, for, uh, for severe diseases that we have now encountered and increasingly will have. But this is common everyday diseases, chronic diseases, that we know we have compelling evidence that if we do certain things, we can prevent suffering, we can prevent complications, and that now we're being rationed by economics. I think rational formularies make sense. That's not for us as a committee to decide, or this report is not proposing guidelines on that context. That needs to consider efficacy and effectiveness of drugs as well as value. And I think there are societal issues that need to be discussed around this topic uh, rather than say, well, anything that comes out is available, everyone should have access to it, versus, well, what are medications that we all should be able to access? Uh, controlling whether it be blood pressure, diabetes, infectious disease, things that we could, as a profession, as a clinician, clinicians, could agree, say, these are important, uh, and then go from there. Uh, and I think that's what I think the intent of, of the package of recommendations. So let me throw this out to the economists for, for a second here. And so if the, if the drug companies refuse to go to the price that the government is negotiating for, where's the leverage? What's the leverage well, for the government? There, there are really two separate categories here. One is the drug that's unique in treatment of a disease. Uh, there's a, a lot of those around, but there's also a very much larger set where there are m different ways to handle the, the therapy. And particularly in those, the, you, to get effective negotiation, you have to have the ability to walk away from the table. That's a sort of the prime rule number one in, in negotiation strategy. Um, so to me, those are the easy part in the formulary question. Uh, if you have an alternative, you've got a much better hand in negotiation. The second part about negotiation, which is why I like that uh, str strategy better than a straight up price control, drug by drug by drug, is negotiation often can, in, uh, you, you go into a manufacturer that's got a bundle of drugs they want to sell, you can negotiate on the bundle rather than on specific drugs, and, and it, in some sense it gives you more degrees of freedom in getting to where you want to go. So I think there's a powerful benefit to having negotiation as the word rather than price control. <laughs> Sounds just like cable. Uh, <laughs> so so th that, that would be the, one of the things I'd want to add. But let, let's be clear, uh, uh, if, you, if you go down that path and you find that you've got, let, take, let me take the second class of drugs where there is only a single provider, uh, if you're still reaching uh, an untenable societal solution, then I think you have to go beyond recommendations that our committee has reached. We've said that if these don't work, you have to look at other options into the future. 
Uh, those would include reimportation of, of drugs from other countries, which is not recommended. Uh, they would include price controls, uh, uh, which we have not recommended. Um, but if you're into a situation where you really feel like this is a social imperative and what we're proposing doesn't work, there are a series of, of more vigorous steps you could take. Uh, I don't think they would be necessary in the case where there are alternatives. Uh, in the case of unique therapies, we'll have to see how industry uh, and the negotiation practice responds. We have to run the experiment in effect before we know how it comes out. I think Michelle has something. Yeah, I was just going to add, in addition to exclusion, which we might view as a sort of nuclear option, there is an intermediate pressure point. Uh, mo private plans have considerable flexibility in how they design their open formularies. Medicare is much more constrained. I think many Americans don't understand or appreciate this, that by statutory design, we have hobbled that program's ability to make use of information about the comparative effectiveness of different therapies. And that was a product of a political deal. It doesn't make economic sense. And it really hampers Medicare's ability to say to drug companies, well, okay, we can't exclude your product, but we're going to put it on a less favorable tier unless we get a concession. Okay, Kaiser, you want to do your second question? Well, and this is hopefully a, a quicker answer. And, and I don't know if um, who wants to a a answer this question. But on, on the orphan drugs, on the dissenting opinion, I noted that the dissenters specifically pointed out that you could simply just lower the exclusivity period to the number of drugs from 200,000 to a much smaller amount. Um, and we talked about cancer drugs earlier. 40% plus of the new orphan drugs are cancer drugs. Many of those are much below to 200,000, some below 2,000. So is that dissenting opinion should, I, I guess I'm wondering if that's a, a rational um, conclusion or would it not actually address the problem at all? Um, I'll take, I'll try to quick crack at that. That's a very useful question. Um, a lot of people propose adopting the cutoffs of different countries. Uh, if you look at the per capita cutoff in Japan, it's 140 thousand, not 200,000. I don't think that's the issue. I don't think the number you use as cut off is the key. I think the real key is the multiple adventures into the, uh, into the uh, buffet line uh, where you have drugs that eventually end up with, uh, in, in many cases, significant numbers of, of repeat applications of, of uh, orf orphan drug status, repeat ex uh, subsidies to the research, repeat uh, extensions of market exclusivity, and ultimately, we've had seen drugs that have been in blockbuster category with mo more than a billion dollars per year in sales that have had orphan drug status. Uh, so, t t uh, you know, you could deal with that more by saying, let's just look at the total number of patients being treated by the drug rather than looking at the salami slicing that's going on. It'd be, you know, an, ap an approach to handle that. I don't think cutting the number down to 40,000 or 20,000 or 150,000 solves the problem, it's the multiple applications uh, uh, of subpopulation. That, by the way, is going to increase as we get into uh, the g genetically uh, uh, controlled uh, personalized medicine. You know, eventually a large number of cancer therapies are going to be personalized medicine because they're all going to be aimed at people with very narrowly specified genotypes. <laughs> uh, so this is a problem that's going to get more and more complicated as technology increases our ability to find out for whom drugs work and for whom they won't work in advance the, and target them that way. Uh, it's going to be a lot more of these things. We have to figure out a way to do that better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to take uh, another question from, from email. So this question is from Emily Miller, who is the editor of DrugWatch.com. Um, data show branded prescription drugs in the U.S. can cost as much as 70% more than the same drugs in other developed countries. Americans are being forced to buy their life-saving medications from other countries, such as Canada, in order to stay alive. Why are Americans paying more than most of the world for the same drugs? Should Americans be allowed to import FDA-approved drugs from other countries to save money? Michelle, that's what I was doing for you. <laughs> Well, as a descriptive matter, we pay more because other countries, many other countries, have set up their schemes to directly peg what they pay to what we pay, a scheme known as reference pricing. So just by definition, we will pay more. Uh, the normative question of why are we willing to pay more is, is a harder one, and it's something that both the report and the dissent um, raise. There is, in a sense, a fundamental unfairness about that, particularly in light of the fact that most of the innovation is, is generated from 
American companies and from research that also is underwritten by our government. Um, but it weighed heavily on the committee in considering our recommendations that if we were to ratchet down prices in here, there would be global ripple effects because we are shouldering some of the rest of the world's burden. Um, so that, I think the, the ethical implications of that have to be taken very seriously. Robert Payer, New York Times. The report, the rep the report says that uh, pricing arrangements uh, and the economics of the biopharmaceutical sector are opaque. Members of the committee all have years and years of experience in this uh, sector. Did any of you learn anything that you found really fresh and new and amazing as you dug into it that you didn't know before about this opaque sector? Well, I think one thing I, I learned was that list prices matter. Uh, you know, we often hear this trope in the in fr statements from the pharmaceutical sector that uh, don't don't look over here. That's just a list price. The real price is much much lower. We can't tell you how much lower, but trust us, it's quite a bit lower. Um, and you know, we can't we we were not able to evaluate the veracity of the claim that it's much much lower because of the opacity in the system. They won't reveal that information. But um, I did come to understand from the pharmacoeconomists in the committee that list price matters uh, regardless of how deep that discount is. And one of the reasons is that for people who are uninsured or have particular kinds of insurance plans, the cost sharing that they pay for their drugs at the pharmacy is not pegged um, to the real price of the drug. It's pegged to the list price. So it doesn't matter uh, if, if others are getting a deep discount those uninsured or underinsured patients are paying dearly at the pharmacy for those drugs because of list price. So it really does matter, and, and we address that in several parts of the report. I want to offer one thing that struck me, uh, which is the, uh, the expiration date that's placed on most drugs uh, uh, probably could be extended uh, rather substantially if data were collected to, uh, to make that possible. And it, there's a, it turns out there's a rather significant sum of money that's thrown out, if you will, uh, by hospitals, uh, clinics, and by individual patients uh, because an expiration date has arrived on a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a small molecule drug that's uh, very stable. And so one of our proposals is that we start gathering more data on the, uh, how long these drugs really are uh, safe and efficacious. The man in green. Uh, Geotech. I'm a researcher in the area of tech transfer and particularly interested in NIH's great technology and scientific research that they fund, and in particular that that funding should be looked at as an investment toward future health of Americans in particular, and they should be an, uh, metrics should be developed that purposely look at how funding tied to future results of greater health for Americans and the world. But a particular interest of I of asking a question today is in the regulatory science kind of area. Or look at the FDA approval process, and there is, there is certainly some movement of trying to streamline or make that system better, faster, and less expensive, and more effective to getting new medications and devices to the American public. Something that, that I found looking at the regulatory process, in particular related to fairly funded research that ultimately goes to a company that wants to develop a device or pharmaceutical that has to be FDA regulated, is when the company applies to the FDA for safety approval and then later for how effective it is and other the other steps that needs to go through there is there's quite a lot of wash washout, meaning at, at each step there seems to be like only one out of five of applications that are that actually proceed forward, meaning four out of five for some reason in the FDA process, probably for good reason, uh, washes out, meaning it doesn't meet the standards to go forward for safety. Um, the FDA does keep data, does keep data on every application and why it washed out, meaning why this particular drug didn't proceed forward for safety reasons. Can I ask you that? That data isn't, isn't released to the public. What's uh, your question, sir? 
would it be a good idea for the FDA or as part of federal policy, any uh, NIH funded research that any drug or device developed with federal money that goes through FDA process, all the data, both positive and negative, should be available to scientists so they can learn from that process to make better decisions to make better drugs and devices available for Americans. Mr. would you want to touch on that? I'll touch on it. Uh, I have no uh, content about FDA, but certainly NIH has been moving in this direction for a number of years. I think the data systems that used to be a limitation, but it's clear now that science is moving toward full transparency. I think basic and biological scientists have been there for a longer time. Clinical scientists are a little bit slower in getting there, so even posting uh, reports of uh, results of studies before they're peer-reviewed for comment on websites. I think physicists are doing this now for a number of years. So I, I think that that's the movement, uh, full transparency of data, especially publicly funded. And in fact, with clinical trials, there's now a mandate that, uh, that re results be published within a defined period of time. I think it's two years of finishing uh, collection of data, and this is from small to large studies and, and do fewer of them in order to get them out. So we're, we're in full agreement with that at NIH. All right, so we'll, we'll take time for, well, oh, you've got, you had a response? Just an addendum to that. We've also uh, suggested in the report that we find better ways to share information with other credibly uh, uh, qualified nations on, on this approval process so that we don't have to keep repeating nation by nation by nation the same safety and efficacy that, that it, in the sense it's try and find ways to learn from each other as well to speed that up. So that's one of our, one of our goals as well. I, you should, I mean, you, don't, you probably do know that FDA doesn't do any of these studies, right? So they actually are getting the reports from the companies who are applying. So they don't have any, I think, authority over making the, the data available, unlike the NIH, which funds the studies. So I think that would take another step to, to get there for the FDA applications to be accessible to the public. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take one more question. Okay, we got two more questions. We'll do this one right here, and but make them snappy. Snappy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Alan Kotok with Science and Enterprise. Uh, the people in the industry will tell you that their business is very, very. very risky and requires a lot of investment for research and development. Have you found any efforts in the industry to improve their, their business processes, their research and development uh, processes to bring these uh, high research and production costs research and production cost down. That was snappy. <laughs> so uh, there are a we did hear testimony on this issue, and there were a couple of things that popped out. One is that for any given successful molecule, just the cost of de the development is inordinately expensive. And we did hear testimony from many in the industry that they were trying to identify ways to reduce the cost of conducting clinical trials. Um, for example, taking a hard look at whether they really need to collect all of the data points that they collect. So that's on their mind, and there's a, a business case for them to do that. I don't see there as being a policy intervention necessary to encourage that to happen. The broader and second problem, though, is that nine out of 10 uh, investigative um, Products never make it to market, and it is covering that kind of risk, the risk of outright failure, that's much harder for the industry. And uh, another thing I learned in this process, to Mr. Pear's question, was, was the really increasingly important role of, of private venture capital in underwriting innovation, particularly for smaller companies, to the extent that that's the wave of the future, that more and more of the early innovation comes from smaller companies that are focusing on just one product and relying on external capital. That, um, that becomes a more and more intractable problem, it seems to me, going forward. And our report doesn't have an answer for it. Okay, we had that one last question. Uh, 
Bob Roy, the BMJ. Um, 27 action points there. Uh, what are your favorite children in the fact that if you had to choose two or three of them that would have the greatest impact upon drug pricing? Well, that's a, a great question that we've thought a lot about. We made a point of not prioritizing because we view the, uh, the recommendations we made and the implementing actions as uh, uh, really a package that goes together. Uh, inevitably, I think we have our favorites. And uh, at the risk of uh, my colleagues not agreeing with me because we never voted on this kind of thing, but I think most of us would say giving the government the authority to negotiate would be uh, uh, high on that list. Uh, I think that uh, greater transparency uh, would certainly be very high on that list. And who wants to pick the third thing? Hey, capping out-of-pocket costs for patients mm -hmm. is, has to be high on the list. Okay, does anyone want to dissent? Well, we were talking about this earlier, and we had exactly the same list over lunch today. So, okay. and Norm wasn't there, so <laughs> <laughs> very we're, good. We are in full accord on those. Okay. Any final thoughts before I close it up? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate uh, your your concise questions, and um, the panelists will be available for a few minutes if you have any uh, other technical questions you want to sort out. Thanks very much. Thank you for doing this.